Boris Johnson has described a global accord to speed up action against climate change as historic and game-changing and the beginning of the end for coal power. But his remarks come after the president of the COP26 climate conference, Alok Sharma, said India and China will have to justify themselves to the world's most vulnerable countries after the two nations demanded last-minute changes to the deal, softening commitments to reduce the use of coal. An agreement was finally reached last night. It says limiting average global temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by the year 2100 is still attainable. Scientists have said that that amount by then would avoid the worst impacts of climate change. But there's controversy over the pledge about coal, which now says its use should be phased down rather than phased out. The deal pledges more money for poorer countries to help them adapt and nations will have to republish their climate plans next year to keep what's been agreed on track. The conference also agreed to reductions in methane emissions and to curb deforestation across the planet. All the details from our science editor, David Shookman. It was billed as a landmark moment in our relations with the planet. But did the Glasgow conference do anything to limit the rise in temperatures? The man at the centre of the talks, Alex Sharma, had to shuttle between delegations. China and India not allowing coal to be phased out, only to be phased down. The pressure really showed at one point. And the final wording on coal has left disappointment. But this evening in Downing Street, Mr Sharma admitted how the deal was very nearly lost. For months, people have been asking me, um, uh, some of you good people have been asking me, do you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders? And I can tell you there was one really tense hour where I did feel the weight of the world on my shoulders. And, you know, so many people have done so much over two years, the UK team internationally, and, you know, this deal was absolutely in jeopardy. His efforts at the conference were praised by opposition parties, but they also warned there's a long way to go. We have made some progress and we have to acknowledge that, but we also have to acknowledge that we failed in getting that target of 1.5 and we must keep that pressure on because it will be catastrophic for areas of the world and for our planet, so we've got more to do. So what happens now? Well, by the end of next year, countries should update their climate pledges a faster pace than before and they are now expected to do this more often. By 2024, a package of long-term financial aid for the poorest nations should be agreed. And then by 2030, to avoid the worst of global warming, carbon emissions should be halved. But we're still a long way from achieving that. So as things stand, the polar ice will melt faster than ever raising sea levels and together with heavier rain threatening millions of people with flooding. The implications of failing to act soon have never been clearer. We've already warmed by 1.1 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times and the hope is that one and a half will be the limit of the rise. But we're heading for at least 1.8 and that's only if every promise is kept. More realistically we're on course for about 2.4 a really dangerous level. The difference between 1.5 and 2.4 is, is really survival of millions and millions of people and species in the, in the planet. This is uh, what is uh, particularly true for the islands. But according to Camilla Bourne, a government advisor at the heart of the talks, the worst outcomes can be averted. We have kept 1.5 alive, but on the basis of delivering on those commitments, and that will be our next task for us as the presidency, but for all the countries, and it's on us to make sure that this is real in action. The key to that is what's happening far beyond the conference. The spectacular fall in the price of renewable forms of energy. They now make good business sense, whatever gets agreed in talks about climate change. The arguments here over the last fortnight were about words on a page and in the end they may or may not prove important. What matters more is the signal sent by this gathering and others to come to businesses, investors, banks, all of us, that with the right pace and scale of change, it should still be possible to get the world onto a safer course. David Shookman, BBC News in Glasgow.
Well, as we've heard, India and China have faced heavy criticism after demanding those last-minute changes to the deal on the issue of coal. India relies heavily on coal for its economic development. Our South Asia correspondent Rajini Vaidyanathan reports on the challenges the country faces in tackling climate change. India's sacred Yamuna River, a symbol of purity, turned toxic. What looks like harmless bubbles is poisonous foam, much of it caused by industrial waste and sewage. Shaquille's a fisherman who lives and works here. All the chemicals are thrown in the river, he tells me. It's disgusting, but it's not a natural disaster. It's humans who've done this. What we're seeing here, in many ways, represents India's overall challenges when it comes to climate change. One of the country's holiest rivers, now horribly polluted. The cause, waste from nearby factories. Factories which create jobs and help drive economic growth. Coal was centre stage at the COP summit. In a similar tussle, over the country's economic and environmental needs. Dirty but dependable. It powers this nation, providing some 70% of India's energy and millions of jobs, which is why the country refused to agree to a deal to phase it out completely. Prime Minister, Prime Minister Narendra Modi did make a bold pledge to hit net zero emissions by 2070 and asked the West for more investment to fund renewable projects. The aim is to move quickly towards alternative sources like solar, with a goal of generating 50% of power that way by the next decade. Vaibhav Chaturvedi's just returned from the COP summit, where he was advising India's government. Coal will grow, but solar will grow much faster. So essentially it's not that you know, only one technology grows and you know, the other does not. Both will have to grow together for meeting the energy demand for this fast-growing economy. The average Indian consumes far less power than the average Brit or American. Many here say they don't want to be told what to do by Western nations who have a long way to go to phase out fossil fuels themselves. Regini Vaidyanathan, BBC News, Delhi. Well, the world's two biggest emitters of greenhouse gases are China and the United States. In a moment, we'll hear from our North America editor, John Sopel, at the White House. First, though, let's go to our China correspondent, Stephen McDonnell. He's in Beijing. Is it fair to say, Steve, that China's really sending out a message here saying it needs longer to reduce its use of coal? Well, China's decades of breakneck economic growth have at times been catastrophic for the natural environment. They've also lifted millions of people out of poverty. This dramatic change in people's living standards has been fuelled by and large by coal-fired power. Now in recent times China has built huge wind and solar farms but officials are still not sure when they can phase out coal so they're wary of making pledges to do so. That said, we shouldn't be too pessimistic because the Communist Party here is already using its media to tell its people that coal is an especially big part of the problem. Beijing has also said that the world's richest countries have benefited the most from coal-fired power, so they need to give the developing world more time to catch up. Well, it's clear that the Biden administration wanted to play a leading role in the talks in Glasgow, and to some extent they've achieved that. Remember, uh, Donald Trump pulled the United States from the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Joe Biden said we must lead, and arguably you wouldn't have had the methane uh, reduction deal that was agreed with the EU were it not for American leadership. And one of the surprises of the talks was the agreement between the US and China to talk about how they could make further progress on this. But Joe Biden can't act unilaterally. He's got political constraints as well. And he's got a Senate which just will not pass measures like, for example, totally eliminating uh, subsidies on fossil fuels. So has Joe Biden gone as far as climate activists, activists wanted? Probably not. But has he gone as far as he could do, given the political strengths of the congressional arithmetic? Well, probably he has. All right. Thanks both John Sopel and Stephen McDonnell.